The gift of prophecy is referred to often in the Bible. But what does it mean for us today? Is Ellen G. White a true prophet of God? In this video, you'll learn what scripture says, as well as how to test a true prophet using the guidelines of the Bible, and we are starting right now. When Aaron and Miriam rebelled against Moses' leadership, God said to them, Hear now my words, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, I speak to him in a dream, Numbers 12 verse 6. Throughout Old Testament times the prophetic gift was in operation. The first person called a prophet in the Bible was Abraham, Genesis 20 verse 7. In the history of Israel, Moses was the greatest of the prophets, he communicated with God face to face, Deuteronomy 34 verse 10. Shortly before his death he told the Israelites, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. This prophecy was initially fulfilled through Joshua and the prophets who followed him. It found its ultimate fulfillment in the appearance of the Messiah who was the prophet who would lead God's people from the slavery of sin into the heavenly Canaan. The New Testament writers as well as several other individuals mentioned in the New Testament had the gift of prophecy, Luke 1 verse 67, Matthew. 11:14, Acts 13 verse 1, 15 verse 32, 21 verse 8 to 10. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that the gift of prophecy would remain in the church till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4 verse 13. In the book of Revelation, therefore, the remnant church in the time of the end is said to have the testimony of Jesus, chapter 12 verse 17 which according to Revelation 19 verse 10 is, the spirit of prophecy. What is the, spirit of prophecy? The term, spirit of prophecy, occurs only once in the Bible, namely in Revelation 19 verse 10, but the readers in John's days knew exactly what John meant by this phrase. They were familiar with this expression, which was frequently used in the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. For example, Genesis 41 verse 38 in the Aramaic paraphrase of the Old Testament text says, Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom there is the spirit of prophecy from before the Lord? And in Numbers 27 verse 18 the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man who has within himself the spirit of prophecy, and lay your hand on him. For the early Christians the spirit of prophecy was a reference to the Holy Spirit, who imparts the prophetic gift to God's messengers. This also becomes evident when we compare Revelation 19 verse 10 with Revelation 22 verses 8 and 9. The situation in both passages is the same. John falls at the feet of the angel to worship him. The words of the angel's response are almost identical, yet the difference is significant. In Revelation 19 verse 10, the brethren are identified by the phrase, who have the testimony of Jesus. In Revelation 22 verse 9, these brethren are simply called, prophets. According to the principle of interpreting scripture with scripture, this leads to the conclusion that, the spirit of prophecy, in Revelation 19 verse 10 is not the possession of church members in general, but only of those who have been called by God to be prophets. That this is not purely an Adventist interpretation can be seen from the writings of other scholars. Lutheran scholar Hermann Strathman, for example, says concerning the phrase, Testimony of Jesus, in 1910, according to the parallel Revelation 22 verse 9 the brothers referred to are not believers in general but the prophets. This is the point of Revelation 19 verse 10, but he, that's the angel, said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. If they have the Marturia Isu, the testimony of Jesus, they have the spirit of prophecy, that is, they are prophets, like the angel, who simply stands in the service of the of Marturia Isu. In summary, we can say that one of the identifying signs of the remnant church, which according to prophecy exists after the 1260-day period, that is after 1798, is the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, or the prophetic gift. 
The Seventh-day Adventist Church, from its very beginning, has believed that in fulfillment of Revelation 12 verse 17 the spirit of prophecy was manifested in the life and work of Ellen G. White. Testing a Prophet How do we know that the prophetic gift in Ellen White's case was genuine and not a counterfeit? The Bible provides several guidelines for testing the prophetic gift. Let's look at them and run Ellen White through them and see if she qualified. First guideline is Dreams and Visions, Numbers 12 verse 6. In Scripture, genuine prophets received prophetic dreams and visions. During her 70-year ministry from 1844 to 1915, Ellen G. White received approximately 2,000 visions and prophetic dreams. Let's do a comparison between a prophet of God who is already known to be a true prophet in the Bible like Daniel, and Ellen White. In Daniel 7 verse 2, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, please you may pause the video and read the rest for yourself and play to continue after that. Now, from Selected Messages Book 3, I was taken off in vision. In that vision. Look at Daniel's words, in my vision, and E.G. White's, I was taken off in a vision, in that vision. It's very clear that they both received visions. The next guideline is, agreement with the Bible, Isaiah 8 verse 20. What a prophet claims to have received from God must be in harmony with the rest of God's word, because God does not contradict himself, Psalms 15 verse 4, and Malachi 3 verse 6. Although Ellen G. White was not a trained theologian, her messages are in harmony with Scripture. For sure Daniel qualified this guideline. The next thing to look out for is how E. G. White fits here. Listen to this statement in the Great Controversy being quoted from Selected Messages Book 1. The Ten Commandments were spoken by God Himself, and were written by His own hand. They are of divine, and not human composition. But the Bible, with its God-given truths expressed in the language of men, presents a union of the divine and the human. Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thus it is true of the Bible, as it was of Christ, that, the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, John 1 verse 14. This is strong evidence that E. G. White's writings are in harmony with the Holy Scriptures. Ellen White's writings shine light on Scripture truths. Ellen White always directed believers to the Bible, notice in her very first book on page 64, this is the last page of the book. She said, I recommend to you, dear reader, the Word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that Word we are to be judged. God has in the Word promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people, and to correct those who err from Bible truth. She admitted that the Bible is superior to her writings. Experience and Views Page 64 Not only that, she also wrote in her most important book according to her, The Great Controversy on page 595, But God will have a people on the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. So from the beginning of her writing and publishing of her work until this important book, The Great Controversy which was one of the last books that she revised and published in 1911 in her older years, she was constantly directing the minds of her readers to the Bible. The next guideline on the list is the witness to Jesus, 1 John 4 verses 1 and 2, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Daniel 7 verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. One like a son of man is no other than Jesus himself. What does E. G. White say? The same statement we just read not long ago is still true for this because E.G. White confesses that Christ has come in the flesh. Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thus it is true of the Bible, 
as it was of Christ, that, the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, John 1 verse 14. Anyone familiar with the writings of Ellen White, such as the books The Desire of Ages or Steps to Christ, will have to admit that she not only accepted all that the Bible teaches about Jesus, but continually pointed people to Him as their Lord and Savior. Next is Fulfilled Prophecy, Jeremiah 28 verse 9. The proof of a true prophet lies, in part, in the fulfillment of his or her predictions. The prophecy of Daniel 11 includes amazing details about great empires, political developments, and end-time powers that would affect the Jews and all people today. Although Ellen White's work did not primarily consist of predicting the future, she did make a number of predictions that have been fulfilled in a remarkable way. An example is the destruction of the World Trade Center towers. It was a horrible event, and has forever changed our world. Oddly, what took place that fateful day bears some similarity to a prediction Ellen White made at the beginning of the 20th century. What follows is, in her own words, a vision or dream she had in late 1901. On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify the owners and builders. Higher and still higher these buildings rose, and in them the most costly material was used. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said, they are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stop the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, Pages 12, 13 Another guideline is the Orchard Test, Matthew 7 verse 20. The Orchard Test takes time. Ellen White lived and worked for 70 years under the critical eyes of millions of people, largely skeptical, doubtful, suspicious, and in some cases openly hostile. Any fault or inconsistency was and still is exposed with great satisfaction by her opponents. Nevertheless, the fruit of her life and labor attests to her sincerity, zeal, and Christian piety. While counterfeit prophets may pass one or two of these tests, a true prophet will pass them all. Just as Daniel, Jeremiah, and the other true prophets passed the test, so has Ellen White certainly passed. We can therefore say that Ellen White is a true prophet of God. God's gracious guidance through the prophetic gift of Ellen White should make us more aware of the responsibility that we, as the remnant church, have, and it should spur us on to finish the work God has given us to do. Watch this video on the fulfilling prophecy in the book of Daniel.